And welcome back to our series on the ways of God. This is lesson number five. Uh, today we're going to study um, the lives of a, of a few men who made a commitment to the Lord and then attempted to, to fill out that commitment in their own way and the result and what happened with them. But we're going to start off in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. So common verses we many of us know it says enter by the narrow way for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and many are those who enter it for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and few are those who find it we take this passage we often uh, refer this to salvation message of giving your life to the Lord giving your life to Jesus and that was the way of life, which is true. But it's not only the salvation message, it applies to everyday decisions you make as you walk out your life in God. The gate is the entrance, it's the door. It's what you give your heart to. It's what you decide to do. The way is how you walk it out. It's your life's journey. The result is either destruction or it's life. So the gate is where I begin. The wide gate, it's all based on self, my plans, my goals, whatever I want to do. It's my life. I can do what I want. After all, it is my life. I remember the first time I read Judges and I came to Judges 21, 25. I said, this encapsulates everything there is to know about the book of Judges. And the failures the men and women did over and over again. It said, in those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now the narrow gate, the narrow gate represents giving my life or my, situ my, my, uh, my issue, committing it to the Lord. Where Jesus says, I am the door, or some verses say, I am the gate. See, until I make a commitment in my heart to the Lord, I have not begun my journey in fulfilling his promises. I'm standing outside the gate, apart from the promises of God that God has for me. He created for me. He's planned for me. I remember I had a dream, and I was uh, the Lord was uh, driving me, and we pulled up on these guard gates. He's, we see them so often here in Arizona, where you punch in a code and you're allowed to go in a community. And as we pulled up the gate, He looked at me and said, "Do you want to enter in? Do you want to go in?" It was my choice. Is concerning an issue in my life, and I had to make the choice. Do I want to enter or not enter? And I told him, I want to enter. So I punched in the code. We entered the gate. But that's the beginning. Now, that's just the beginning. The second part is the way. The way is how you walk out our daily promises in order to fulfill the promises God has for me. It says, I enter, the, I enter by the narrow way, for the gate is wide, the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those who enter it. The gate is small. The way is narrow that leads to life. And few are those who find it. Now I've come through the gate. Now I must commit my way to him. Psalm 37 verse 5 says this. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. He will do it. When I go through the gate with him, then I choose to commit walking with him in the narrow way. I'm giving him license in his way to lead me into situations, events, circumstances, confrontations, disappointments, relationships, etc. In order to reveal the things that are in my heart, which are hindering me from entering into the promises that he has for me. Or we would call it the way which means I am giving him full reign in all the fears doubts lust unforgiveness pride jealousy anxiousness envy anger etc that's in my heart this way is where your faith will be tested because oftentimes things don't go the way you think they should go and your temptation will rise I want to go back to Egypt that's why it says, when you commit your way 
to the Lord. The next verse says this, trust also in him. Because as you commit your way, there's going to be many times you'll be tempted not to trust him. I mean, you can only trust him to the degree that you believe he is good. In that same dream, after I'd gotten through the gate, the Lord pointed to me the way I was to go, and the way was very narrow. And I noticed my easy chair would not make it through the narrow passage that I had to go through. And I wanted to turn back. But as I look back, the gate was closed because I already made a commitment. Now, I had two choices at that time. I can stay right at the gate and never go anywhere and go around the mountain over and over again. Or I can say yes to his way and I'd lose my easy chair. First person we're going to study is, is uh, Naaman. Na Naaman. Naaman was a captain of the Armenian army who had leprosy. He was told by a servant girl, an Israeli, young Israeli, if he could go to Israel, he could be cured of it. So Naaman comes and presents himself to Elisha, the prophet. Now when he goes there, he is already committed in his heart. He's already entered the gate. I want your way, Lord. I want your promises for me. But now he comes to the way. 2 Kings chapter 5, 8 through 14. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway at the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger to him, say, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be stored to you, and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. And are not the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be cleaned? So he turned away in a rage. Naaman was furious. Why? Well, here's the clue. He said, Behold, I thought. See, he had already figured out how God should heal him. He thought, this is how God should do it. If I was God, God would do it this way. God didn't and wasn't going to do it the way Naaman thought. Therefore, Naaman became angry and turned away from his miracle. We must remember Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. But also Proverbs 19 verse 3 says this, The foolishness of man ruins his way, and his heart rages against the Lord. Naaman was foolish to be angry at God. He wanted, wanted his own way. Now luckily, his servants convinced him to change his mind. And therefore, his, light, his thoughts lined up with God's thoughts. And as a result of his change of thinking, he changed his ways to line up with God's ways. And he went and dipped in the River Jordan. The result being, he received his healing. The next one we're going to study is Jeroboam. 1 Kings chapter 11 because Solomon had sought after other gods and had not walked in the ways of God. So upon his death, the Lord was going to split the kingdom in two, Israel with 10 tribes to the north and Judah with two tribes to the south. Rehoboam would be king of Judah in the south and Jeroboam would be king of Israel in the north. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 31 while Solomon was still alive, a prophet, Ahijah, came to Jeroboam and prophesied to him. He said to this, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and I will give you ten tribes. Verse 37 and 38 of that same chapter. He goes on to say, I will take you, and you shall reign over whatever you desire, and you'll be king over Israel. 
Then it will be that if you listen to all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight by observing my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and I'll build you an enduring house as I built for David and I will give Israel to you. That's a phenomenal promise. As David is honored on the lips of every Israeli and every Christian to this day, God was giving a promise to Jeroboam, this is what I have for you also. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 20, Jeroboam begins his reign over Israel as king. Therefore, Jeroboam has entered into the gate. Now he has a choice of the way he is going to, re to reign. Amplified version of 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 26 says this, Jeroboam doubted the promises, God's promises to him, and said in his heart, Now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If these people go up to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem to offer sacrifices, then their heart will turn to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me in return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king took counsel and followed some bad advice and made two calves of gold and said to the people, it is too much for you to go all the way to Jerusalem. Behold, your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. This is right from our lesson number two. Jeroboam doubted the promises of God, doubted that God had a wonderful plan for his life, God doubted that God truly loved him. Therefore, he refused to believe or just didn't believe. And because of his doubt, he gave in to fear and embraced the lie of the enemy. And he thought wrongly, these people will kill me and return to Rehoboam. And God promised him he would take care of him and he would make him a name like David. This is his thoughts and his fears are totally against what God promised him. He doubted God and embrace the lie. Therefore, he devised his own plans and went his own way in order to fulfill his calling as king over Israel. First Kings chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. Now at that time, a son of Jeroboam became sick. So Jeroboam said to his wife, Rise now and disguise yourself so that they will not know you are the wife of Jeroboam and go Shiloh. Behold, Ahijah, the prophet, is there, who spoke to me concerning that I would be king over this people. Now, he's repeating this word, I believe, because he believed he was actually doing God's will. He pursued and attained the objective of God's call in his life, being king. He pursued the objective, but he didn't pursue the relationship, the way. So he was reminding the prophet, I'm doing God's will. I am the king. You called me to be a king, and I am the king. But if you read the story of Jeroboam along the way, over and over again, the Lord came to him to repent. And over and over again, he said, no, I'm going my own way. See, we totally miss God's way when we start to assume that we are supposed to work on God's objectives rather than being totally committed to his will. In walking in his way because Jeroboam would did not walk in the ways of the Lord here's what the prophet told his wife go say to Jeroboam thus says the Lord of Israel because I exalted you among the people and made you leader over my people Israel you also have done more evil than all who were before you and have gone before gone before and made yourself other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger Therefore, I'm bringing calamity on the house of Israel, and I will cut off from Jeroboam every male person, both bond and free, in Israel. And I'll make a clean sleep of the house of Jeroboam as one sweeps away till dung is all gone. It goes on to say, Jeroboam died. Two years later, Basha became king, and he came and killed and destroyed everyone who was in Jeroboam's household. 
by going his own way instead of instead of being exalted for all eternity like David, all his family was destroyed. The third person we're talking about is David, about a situation he was involved in. Second Samuel talks about the ark was at the house of Abinadab, where it came to rest after the Philistines returned. And if you recall, the Israelites lost the ark to the Philistines. They had captured it. But after the Philistines had the ark in their, in their presence, everyone there was breaking out in boils and they went to get rid of it. So they returned it to Israel. And they returned it to a place, a house of Abinadab. Second Samuel chapter 6 it said, David desires to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. So he counsels with his elders, and they all agree, let's do this, it's a good thing. Let's bring it back to Jerusalem. So that was the gate. They committed in their heart to doing what God wanted them to do. Second Samuel chapter 6 verse 3 says, They place the ark of God in a new cart, that they may bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Benadab, were leading the new cart. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the ark. But it goes on, it says, But when they came to the threshing floor of Nakon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark and, and took a hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against him. And God struck him down there for his irreverence. He died there by the ark of God. Second Samuel 6, verse 8. David became angry and grieved and offended because the Lord's out, outburst against Usa. Remember Proverbs 19, verse 3. The foolishness of man ruins his way and his heart rages against the Lord. There is no doubt that David's intention to bring the ark to Jerusalem were good. And if the truth be told, we often ourselves have gotten angry at the Lord, saying, Lord, why are you hindering me? Why aren't you working with me on this? After all, I'm just trying to do your will. You see, pursuing the right cause does not justify the way of accomplishing it. Or we would say the ends do not justify the means. See, God had given a way. He'd already given clear directions on the way an ark should be moved. And it was in Numbers chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. The ark is to be carried on the shoulders of the Levites. See, God had plainly revealed his way, but David at this time had a better idea. One he had taken from the way of the Philistines. For you see, when the Philistines returned the ark to the Israelites, their spiritual leaders said this, Now take therefore and prepare a new cart and two milk cows on it, which have never been yoked. In other words, this is the way the Philistines did it. So David would also take that and put it on a new cart. However, God never said anything about using a new cart. This was the world's way to accomplish the will and law of God. Thus, David did things the wrong way, following after his own ideas or the own ideas of others concerning God's ways. Remember what I mentioned in the first lesson, Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. The way of the Philistines equals the way of the world. God did not lead them the way of the Philistines because he said, when they see war, they'll be tempted to return to Egypt. In other words, when it gets a little tough and they don't understand what God is doing, they'll get angry and return into the world. See, God's word 
Work must be performed in God's ways. You'll never accomplish God's will in man's way. Now, this is not my purpose on this lesson, but everybody's going to ask me about Uzzah. How come, how come he died? Well, it did say he was irreverent. It's very interesting. When the Ark of the Covenant came back to his house, the Bible says 50,000 Israelis looked into the Ark, and 50,000 died. Irreverence toward God. The house, the Ark of the Covenant lived in a, a house of Abinadab for a, a number of years. I think 20, but I, I have to go back and look at it. And uh, Musa had to have known of the story of the, of the 50,000 men who died. And that the Ark is something to be reverenced, not to be touched not to be trifled with. It's the presence of God. It's Ananias and Sapphira lying to Peter and dying before the presence of God. The presence of God is holy. And I'm getting off on another tangent. Okay. But anyway, David. First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 13. David humbled himself to the Lord. After he was angry with him, he humbled himself, which is the key. That is why David is revered to this day among the Israeli people and among the Christian people. Because he did many things wrong, which we don't know about. But his key was he always humbled himself. Psalm 51, is, he exclaimed, Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. Take not the Holy Spirit from me. His relationship, he cared more about his relationship with the Lord, walking with God, than he cared about anything else. That's why David's name is exalted to this day. Let me read 1 Corinthians, or 1 Chronicles 15, verse 13. It says, Because of you, the Levites did not bring up the first time. The Lord broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. God has a gate, God has a door, but God has a way. See, as we walk with God in his ways, it seems confusion is our lot in life. As we cannot, for the life of us, figure out what he's doing and why he does it. I'm reminded what it says in the, what it says in Psalms 37. Commit your way to the Lord. And the next verse reads, trust also in him. Because when you commit your way to him, you're going to be tested. And you're just going to have to trust him. And you can only trust him to the degree that you believe he is good. See, we often accuse God of just throwing us into disagreeable circumstances, just to harass and torment us. No, those circumstances are designed of the Lord to release you from your self-life and usher you into the life of God. All the circumstances he brings my way are designed of him to reveal my heart and for me to see my heart and yield that part of my life to him. He does this in order to prepare me to receive his promises. This is his loving hand. But this also is where your faith grows. As you walk with him and come to know and love him. And love the one who loves you. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your lessons. We want to be people of your way. We want to walk with you. We want to talk with you. We want to know you. We want to be people who do not rise up in anger because we don't like your ways. We know people say, yes, Lord, your will, not mine. Your purpose is not man, mine. Your way is not mine. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.